Good morning. Welcome to this discussion of uh, border enforcement and the state of the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, we, um, my name is Doris Meissner, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Migration Policy Institute. Uh, I certainly want to welcome everybody that's in the room, but also everybody that's on live stream, uh, because um, the live stream audience tends to get bigger and bigger as these issues escalate and, and uh, spread around the country. And so we uh, are no, not only live streaming, but I want to announce in advance that those who are on the live stream should be, uh, are able to tweet uh, questions uh, to migration policy or use the hashtag MPI discuss. You can also email to events at migrationpolicy.org. Uh, we're releasing two reports this morning. They are on your chairs if you're in the room. Uh, they are also posted on our website. Um, uh, so they're available at migrationpolicy.org. And you also have bios on your chairs as well as posted. So I'm not going to give detailed background on our distinguished guests beyond saying that they are distinctly distinguished guests. Um, uh, on my right, of course, is my colleague, uh, Randy Capps, who is the director of research for the US work that we do here at the Migration Policy Institute. But then we're also joined by um, Gil Kurlikowski and Arturo Sarakan. Gil Kurlikowski just finished uh, a period as the uh, Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection at the Department of Homeland Security and is now uh, ensconced in academia at the Kennedy School at Harvard as a, a distinguished fellow and professor of practice in criminal justice also at Northeastern University. And of course, Arturo Sarakan, somebody that we know well in Washington and at MPI, former ambassador of Mexico to the United States during um, the period, much of the period that we'll be talking about, 2007 to 2013, and also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. So what we have today is a, a release of two reports that deal with issues of U.S., Mexico, Mexican migration in particular to the United States. Uh, we're going to go over those reports for you and give you the main takeaways or uh, conclusions from them. We're not going to talk about the reports in detail. They're actually quite detailed reports. We want to use them as a springboard for looking at the broader issues surrounding border enforcement today. But the reports themselves have very interesting information and trends, so you'll be able to deal with them, particularly those of you who are um, uh, researchers and into the, into the uh, metrics of these issues. So I'm going to ask Randy to make a short presentation about the research itself, but then we'll move from that research to a broader discussion uh, uh, among Gil, Arturo, myself, and ultimately the audience. So Randy, with that, tell us about the research. All right. Thank you, Doris. And thanks everyone who came this morning and is joining us by live stream. As Doris mentioned, we are um, releasing two new MPI studies today. The first one is a statistical profile of Mexican adults repatriated uh, from the United States. Uh, the authors of this report are former and current MPI researchers Ryan Schultes and Ariel Ruiz. Um, this is an analysis of administrative data from Mexico on people who were deported over a several year period from the United States, uh, primarily, and also a survey, a random survey of those migrants at the northern border of Mexico called the Amif Norte. The second um, the second report is a review of the Consequence Delivery System, or CDS. Um, I'm a co-author on this report along with Doris, as well as MPI colleague Faye Hipsman. Um, this report was actually funded under a grant from the Department of Homeland Security through uh, the Science and Technology Directorate. Um, and uh, although the findings that I'm going to discuss today don't represent DHS's point of view, they're solely the point of view of us as researchers. Um, it's an analysis of data that the CBP gave us 
about the consequence delivery system, the consequences imposed on migrants apprehended at the U.S.-Mexico border over a four-year period, as well as findings from field work that we conducted in the two busiest border patrol sectors, Tucson, Arizona, and Rio Grande Valley, Texas. So looking at the first um, report, the statistical profile of uh, Mexicans uh, repatriated from the United States, you can see a very dramatic drop by about two-thirds in the total number of, of, of repatriations. Um, again, this is from the administrative data in Mexico, and it pretty much corroborates uh, what we've seen in U.S. Border Patrol apprehensions. The drop is from about 600,000 in 2009 to about 200,000 in 2015. Um, but really, our top finding is that within this group, the, the, the percent that indicated that they would return to the United States dropped very dramatically over this period. And so uh, we calculated the total number of uh, deported Mexican adults that indicated that they would return to the United States, um, which dropped by about 80% from 470,000 in 2005 to 95,000 in 2015. And over the same time period, the share in the number who intended, said they, in the survey, that they intended to stay in uh, Mexico rose uh, quite substantially. So we interpret this pattern uh, to indicate a substantial decline in recidivism. That is, uh, the pool of people, if you will, in Mexico who would uh, attempt to return to the United States shrank considerably. And uh, an increased pool of people or population in Mexico with the need for uh, reintegration and reception services. Um, this chart sort of pulls those two data points together. Um, the line on here shows that the share uh, that said that they intended to return to the United States dropped from 95% or virtually all in 2005 to just about half, 49% in 2015. And if you multiply that times the total number of people repatriated, which is the first line chart that I showed you, you get a drop from 471,000 to 95,000 intending to return. At the second report, which is the review of the consequence delivery system, this is about what the Border Patrol has been doing really since the mid 2000s to impose more severe consequences other than just turning around and returning people immediately to Mexico on apprehended migrants. Um, it used to be that virtually all the migrants that were apprehended at the border were returned voluntarily without uh, significant additional immigration consequences, usually within a day or two and some, usually sometimes within a few hours. The share returned voluntarily um, was about 41% in fiscal 2011 and had dropped to just 9% in fiscal 2014. The converse side of that is that the share who had formal removals um, these could be removals adjudicated by an immigration judge, but in most cases they're expedited administrative removals um, that were authorized under the 1996 immigration law. And the important thing about this is when someone has a formal removal, it carries a bar on legal admission to the United States, often for many years, um, and also the threat of expedited uh, rapid deportation if someone is caught again. And it's worth noting that people with these formal removal orders that have been apprehended in the U.S. recently in the last couple of months, actually, even if they're inside the United States, if they have that prior removal order, they can be deported very quickly within a day or two. So these are real penalties now with real teeth. And so the share with formal removals rose from 59% in fiscal 2011 to 91% in fiscal 2014. So by that time, virtually everyone um, apprehended at the border was getting these formal removal charges. A substantial share, about 15%, also were being deported through a different sector. So in other words, if they were apprehended in Arizona, they might be deported through Texas. If they were apprehended in California, they might be deported through Arizona. And 17% um, received the most severe consequence, which is a, a federal criminal charge of uh, illegal entry or reentry. Again, these charges were authorized in the 1996 Immigration Act. Um, and this carries potential prison time with it, up to uh, six months in the case of an illegal entry charge and quite a bit more than that for, for re-entry. So basically, taken together, these consequences make illegal entry more costly and time-consuming. So partially as a result of these um, uh, new consequences, we see the recidivism rate falling. And these are the data that were shared with us um, by 
um, the Border Patrol, as well as some other outcome metrics. And you can see that in 2007, um, close to 30 percent of those apprehended were reapprehended again in the same fiscal year. Um, that's the re annual reapprehension rate, and that rate dropped to 14 percent by 2014. We looked at other measures such as the time between apprehensions, and that time increased over this time period, and the average number of apprehensions of an individual declined as well. Um, so these consequences that I discussed of use of formal removal instead of return, the lateral repatriation from one sector to another, criminal prosecution, mostly can be imposed administratively and quickly on those um, apprehended migrants from Mexico, and that's where most of them have been used. But there are limits to imposing these consequences on other migrants. And the important thing to bear in mind here is it, for the first time in fiscal 2014, just over half of those apprehended were not from Mexico. Um, they were predominantly from the Central American countries of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. Um, that share not from Mexico was just under half in 2015, but it was over half again in 2016. And, um, the group, those who are not from Mexico cannot be deported as quickly. They can't be um, deported through the land borders with Mexico, of course. They have to be flown back to their home countries. And so that sort of changes the pace and the operation of consequence delivery. Also, many of them are asylum seekers. So over the three-year period, 2014 to, to 16, more than a third of apprehended migrants were either in families, children, or they were other as asylum seekers. And those who seek asylum have the right to go before an immigration judge. And as all of you are probably aware, that's a lengthy process now that can take up to several years. And in general, they've been released during that period. And of course, being released into the United States for a period of months or years is a much less severe consequence than the other ones that I discussed earlier. So in conclusion, based on both reports, we find additional substantial evidence that large-scale legal immigration from Mexico is a thing of the past. These are just more indicators um, to prove that point. That's not just because of consequence delivery. It's also because of fundamental changes in Mexico, demographic and economic changes that are probably irreversible, as well as some softening of the low-skilled labor market in the U.S. So we don't expect a, a rebound in Mexican migration absent a sharp economic shock in Mexico. Alongside this, recidivism is down, so that the cycle of people trying over and over again to come across the border illegally, um, that's also largely a thing of the past. And that's because of the uh, deterrence on the border, but it's also because of these new flows from Central America. There's a lot more first-time migrants now than there were a few years ago. And then the border enforcement strategies that were effective with Mexican adult migrants, and this is where we get into the policy conversation, those that I mentioned earlier, are often not applicable to migrants in these newer mixed flows. Um, so thank you. Okay, so here you have some numbers and reports that are um, that, that, that have pretty dramatic numbers. I mean, these are not small differences. Um, so uh, thank you, first of all, to Randy uh, and the other uh, researchers and authors, as well as the um, uh, DHS and the Border Patrol for uh, working with us to pull these numbers together. I want to also acknowledge in the audience Ariel Ruiz and Ryan Schulteis, who are in the front row, who are the principal authors of the work that took place with the Mexican data. And the thing that is, I think, quite interesting about this work is the parallel uh, of the look at U.S. data and different Mexican data, but the real corroboration and uh, 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 validation of these different sets of data that point to such similar and important and, in fact, historic trends. Um, so that's the data. That's a look at, as Randy described it, things that in the data and in the experience of dealing with these issues for now decades uh, uh, really describe that this large-scale unauthorized migration from Mexico that we have uh, witnessed and worked with for more than 40 years is, in Randy's words, a thing of the past. We know it's a thing of the past in the data. We would not know that in any way from the policy discussion that takes place 
in Washington on the Hill and in many parts of the country uh, generated through this presidential campaign of the last year. Uh, if you listen simply to that, if you look primarily at what has been happening in Congress, you would think that there are hundreds of thousands of people, dangerous people, spilling across the southwest border on a daily basis, uh, and that we have a national security vulnerability and a border that is not in control to the point that we need to be considering appropriations in the multi-billions of dollars for building a wall. To the point also that that discussion and request on the part of the administration to begin funding for that project nearly led to a government shutdown. And it's only because the administration pulled back on the request for money for that purpose now, uh, uh, postponing it only for several months to a debate that will most likely start up again later in the year in the context of appropriations for the coming fiscal year, fiscal year 18 budget. Uh, and, you know, it that bill and that debate is alive and well this very week. I mean, it's going to be signed this week, the agreement uh, uh, to hold off, uh, but to still keep the issue and the request alive was only resolved over this past weekend. So there is a tremendous disconnect between what it is that we know based on the evidence and what it is that is taking place in our national discourse. And that's what we'd like to try to unpack a little bit <laughs> this morning uh, in order to try to provide a better understanding of what in fact is going on and how it is that we continue to have this inability to get a meeting of the minds uh, uh, based on what's happening on the ground. But we're an evidence-driven organization. These gentlemen are people that have dealt in both of those realms <laughs> with the organizations, with the evidence, but also in the broader uh, political context in each of our countries as well as between our countries. So um, we're going to start out by hearing some comments from each of them, and then we'll try to probe uh, uh, some of the issues a little bit more fully uh, before then finally opening up for uh, questions and answers from the audience. Gil, I'm going to ask you to comment first and um, uh, ask you to talk about where we've been over the last really 15, 17 years. I mean, our high water mark on apprehensions in this country at the U.S.-Mexico border was the year 2000. Uh, it was 1.6 million as compared to the numbers that we're talking about today. Um, what do you think have been the real achievements in terms of border enforcement at the southwest border? And if you were still uh, responsible for these functions, where would you be looking for strengthening? So I think that uh, a couple things are, are important to keep in mind. One is the rhetoric that uh, continues to spew forth, uh, both from the administration and, and also from elected officials about the border. Uh, I spent 14 years as a police chief in, in two of the country's largest cities. Um, I probably wouldn't have lasted 14 weeks if I would have continued to um, in, engage in generating fear uh, by standing somewhere and saying people need to be afraid, they need to be very afraid. Uh, government will protect you. Uh, by the way, we don't want to be transparent about it. We don't want to be held accountable. Uh, and, uh, and if uh, the mayor that I worked for or the city council members were unhappy about that, well, then they should just change the law. It's totally unconscionable and, and, and frankly, irresponsible to generate fear, uh, especially by standing on the border. So Doris mentioned the 1.6 million. And then uh, in 2015, talking fiscal years, uh, the number was 337,000. It's an 80% reduction in people coming across the border. If you reduced cancer in 16 years by 80%, you'd probably be in Oslo accepting the Nobel Prize for medicine. But let's talk about the difference uh, for, for a minute about the difference in, in, in the way this is discussed. 
almost every day on a regular basis you hear about not the southwest border, you hear about the porous southwest border, even though it's down 80%. So New York City had a high water mark in 1990 of well over 2,000 homicides. Last year, 2016, it was reduced to uh, about to 335. That's an 85% reduction. The administration praises New York City for an 85% reduction in, in homicides as one of the safest big cities, if not the safest large city uh, in the United States. So how can an 80% reduction in illegal crossings uh, continue to say that this is the poorest border with, uh, with, with dangerous people coming across, uh, but an 85% reduction in, in homicides and, and uh, likely uh, also in violent crime uh, is something praiseworthy and, and noteworthy. That's the difference between policing a city, and I took an oath on several occasions uh, uh, to police cities and to protect the people within those cities uh, uh, by trying to gain community trust through transparency. And the last thing you wanted to do was engender fear uh, in, in people. When President Obama took office and I was his drug policy advisor, uh, I started in, in May of 2009, there wasn't anyone in the administration or the executive branch that did not realize the importance of relationships with Mexico at every level, from the Department of Education, Health and Human Services, certainly from the Department of Homeland Security, but also on the drug issues uh, as, as the drug policy advisor. And I think uh, my very first trip out of the country was... Uh, was in fact to Mexico. Um, uh, everyone recognized that we must approach these issues, not just border security, but the relationship with Mexico holistically. There is a, they're the third largest trading partner. Economy has increased tremendously, and the cooperation with Mexico uh, on, on economic issues, uh, and in particular trade, has been phenomenal in these last numbers of, uh, uh, of years. But going there and making sure that everyone, everyone from the Secretary of State throughout the administration knew that if we looked at Mexico as a partner in improving their economy, their safety, their security, work through the Department of State on the Merida Initiative uh, to improve those things, that also has a significant impact on the number of people leaving Mexico to come to the United States uh, Ill illegally. Because if and, and I know that this could be debated, but understanding that safety and security are better in Mexico, that the economy is better, gives people pause to say, do I really need to take the risk uh, of coming across the border? So at every level of law enforcement cooperation, information sharing, technology, um, uh, to a host of other uh, to a host of other uh, administration efforts, uh, and also with a number of members of Congress. Also, uh, the relationship with Mexico, uh, I, I think, at that time and over those la those eight years, was probably never better. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the resources that are at the border at the present time, and um, and the nature of the flows, uh, other issues, the drug issues, other issues of crime. The border isn't just immigration. It isn't just illegal immigration. It is an international border. Where, where are the smart investments that need to be made? I, I don't think there's any question that um, uh, attempting to build a wall um, doesn't make a lot of fiscal sense and uh, uh, as uh, Congressman Hurd said, it's, uh, it's a great third century uh, 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 way to, to fix a, a migration problem, but uh, I don't think it worked in the third century either. So I think that uh, investments in technology, continuing investments in technology, as you know, on the border we have everything from tethered aerostats uh, to, to essentially far more boots on the ground, about 16,000 border patrol agents, not to mention the customs agents. But improvements in technology uh, uh, can, be, uh, can be made, in, uh, uh, and, and of course the technology is evolving all the time. But also improvements, there's about 700 miles of fencing, and it is a variety of, of fencing from 
from fencing that would stop a vehicle to actually very high uh, steel barriers to double lines of fencing. Uh, it's expensive to build, it's very expensive to maintain, um, but there are places probably where the fencing could be either strengthened or improved uh, and, and the technology. Um, uh, I think that uh, the, the number of Border Patrol agents on the border right now, uh, going back in your time, in fact, Doris, I mean, it, it is just a phenomenal increase in, in the number of boots on the ground. I mean, you look at, at San Diego, I think there are far more Border Patrol agents than in the San Diego Police Department or the San Diego uh, uh, County Sheriff's Department. Well. Uh, statistic that communities along the border have uh, collectively and individually some of the lowest crime rates in in the country because of course there is such a tremendous law enforcement presence um, not only federal but then uh, 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 but then community based um, in terms of technology and in te and technology investments what are the technologies that are uh, are really the most important ones and are there are there breakthrough areas where new technologies ought to be introduced just because there are better technologies or is this really a matter of keeping abreast and maintaining the sensors, the uh, screens, uh, you know, tracking screens and so forth. Well, you certainly don't want to lose the investments in R&D research and development on what technologies might be available. Uh, the integrated fixed towers uh, that have been going up have a far better range, and you can go back to looking at things like SBI Net, uh, which did not turn out to be a, a particularly good investment, but you can look at uh, some of the investments in technology, continuing to maintain um, money and time in, uh, in research and development on things like tunnel detection. We still don't have a particularly good way of detecting tunnels almost universally in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the San Diego area. But I think what does not get recognized is not just the changes in flows from less people from Mexico, more people from Central America, but when I was sworn in in March of 2014, I was in McAllen within a week, uh, and that was a summer of 68,000 unaccompanied children. And, uh, uh, and they weren't unaccompanied children who were running, hiding, trying to elude uh, the Border Patrol. They were people immediately going up to the Border Patrol. And over these last several years, actually beginning around 2012, we've seen family units, uh, mothers with children, fathers with children, they go up to the, to the agents, and if they're crossing, they, uh, um, they want to be taken into custody. They want to make a claim of some type of some level of protection. Uh, oftentimes they're dehydrated or they need some, some type of assistance. But we also saw a bit of a change, too, as people actually walked up to the ports of entry and then made their claim for, for some type of protective status. Uh, marijuana seizures, marijuana universally was coming across uh, the border between the ports of entry. Marijuana seizures have been down five or six years. Uh, we have eight states now, uh, regardless of how you feel about it, I have my opinions. We have eight states with uh, uh, <laughs> marijuana as, uh, that's been legalized. Uh, so marijuana seizures have been down. Uh, what is, a, of course, a dangerous phenomenon is the increase in, in heroin and the increase in uh, or certainly fentanyl, uh, a very powerful pain reliever that's being used uh, uh, that's also help, you know, responsible for a number of deaths. Those, that either comes in through air cargo, fentanyl, or it comes in uh, at a port of entry, someone concealing it on their body or someone uh, trying to conceal it in a vehicle. And, uh, and to bring it into the United States. Uh, I think uh, Senator Markey has a, a pending legislation to give CBP uh, additional resources and technology, particularly to detect fentanyl, uh, because it is so hard to detect. Uh, it is so dangerous. Uh, even mere skin absorption can cause an overdose uh, or, or a, a death. So those kinds of technologies at our ports of entry are just as important as between the ports of entry. Yeah, so you're talking about more targeted re in resources, but targeted at particular kinds of issues and problems that are emerging and, and um, uh, not so much the classic Mexican migration. Well, so Arturo, on 
classic Mexican migration to the United States. Um, uh, let's bring you in uh, with the sort of starting point that we all know and is very familiar now, which is that there are net more people returning to Mexico uh, than uh, coming from Mexico to the United States. Uh, that's, of course, a historic turnaround. From the Mexican side of all of this, um, talk to us about what's changed in Mexico that brings this historic change about. Um, uh, from, is it lasting? Uh, and um, um, uh, comment, if you would, on some of the comments that Gil made originally about U.S.-Mexican cooperation, because we are in this together, and there is a deep, long story that goes across many administrations uh, of Mexico and the U.S. attempting to deal with these issues uh, collaboratively. Uh, well, good morning, uh, Doris. Thank you for uh, the invitation to join you. This is an institution with, with which I have proudly worked for many, many years in trying to understand how we uh, continue to deepen and widen uh, uh, Mexican U.S. collaboration on, on border security issues and border issues in general. And my dear friend Gil, with whom I was so proud to serve for so many years um, as we worked together uh, during the Obama administration um, to tackle a lot of these issues that we're discussing today, in which for unfortunately, um, uh, given the conversation today, given the narrative today, um, is a serious setback to, to, to how we have moved forward. Um, you, you've asked uh, uh, you've asked that I address sort of the zero net migration dynamics and 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 there are two pieces to this one is what what drove this or what has driven this and then the second one is narrative um, let, let me first address sort of what why why zero met net migration has happened and as you as you mentioned uh, and we still you and I had a lot of discussions as to why 2000 was this peak year of, of uh, undocumented Mexican migration across the border into the United States because um, usually when you see these uh, very profound changes in in the patterns of of, uh, of uh, migration flows there's either a political crisis or an economic crisis, and there was neither in 2000 in Mexico. Uh, remember, 2000 was um, a relatively peachy and rosy year, if you think of it as a year where many Mexicans felt encouraged that uh, 71 years of one-party rule had come to an end. There was no significant economic crisis at the time, so there's a, there's a bit of a weird um, peak there in, in terms of the patterns of, of migration, but since then, um, it, it not only started going down, but in the last six, seven years, it fundamentally changed uh, to reach zero net migration. Why has this happened? It, it's, it's as Randy has said in his opening remarks. It's a combination of factors. Um, one is changing demographics in Mexico. Um, Mexico's birth rates have dramatically changed over the past two decades, and um, it is having an impact on uh, uh, available labor and uh, uh, labor pools. Uh, a, a, a growing. I'm, I'm not saying that it, it is it is growing at the rates that it would need to grow to bridge the economic asymmetries that do persist between Mexico and the United States. But a Mexican economy that has been growing at an average 2.2, 2.3 uh, yearly for the past decade, more or less, with ups and downs, uh, is anchoring more workers and more talent in Mexico. The Mexican uh, successive Mexican governments have, have made a very serious investment in. Uh, training, particularly uh, uh, engineers, but uh, uh, re really rethinking how you train human capital via uh, community colleges, ensuring that those community colleges are tied to the profile and the demands of the uh, labor market and the private sector in each region in Mexico. And this has had also a very important impact on anchoring jobs. Um, certainly, uh, the 2009 uh, recession in the United States had a profound impact, particularly in ag and in services uh, and hospitality industries in the United States, a much softer market. Word of mouth is probably the most efficient way uh, that, that impacts uh, the, the, where you see uh, migration flows being impacted. Um, uh, I was Consul General of Mexico in New York for three years before being the ambassador. And when you work with diaspora communities, you can really sense how uh, what we 
call in Spanish Radio Pasillo or the grapevine in English is probably one of the most effective ways of transmission of information within immigrant and diaspora communities. And so the Radio Pasillo uh, of, of how a much softer U.S. economy as of 2009 had impacted available jobs also had an impact in deterring and bringing down uh, migration, uh, heightened enforcement on the U.S. border, and one, one of the facets that, at least in my book, I think has been uh, uh, equally responsible, which is um, people tend to forget, and this is something that Gil and I worked on a long time, that um, uh, transnational organized crime, even though the Houston Chronicle hated my guts for saying this, uh, is like any business. Um, they do hostile takeovers and mergers and acquisitions. And if we were squeezing their ability to make money be, uh, as a result of uh, 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 the trafficking of illicit drugs and narcotics, uh, uh, transnational organized crime working on both sides of the border started bleeding into and muscling its way into other illicit activities, among them sm human smuggling and human trafficking. And so... Uh, also word of mouth uh, with migrant communities and diaspora communities of how much dangerous, how much more dangerous it had become attempting to illicitly cross the border into the United States because of the heightened presence of transnational organized crime uh, uh, muscling its way into human trafficking and human uh, smuggling. Um, so all, all of this, I think, Doris, has had an impact on, on these trends that continue uh, to this day. Um, but I also mentioned the word narrative because you, you will remember, and you will remember too, that right before, and I hate the word surge, so I'm not going to use it, uh, but right before this very important uptick in uh, unaccompanied uh, uh, minors from Central America crossing the border from Mexico into the United States in the summer of 2014, most of Capitol Hill and most of mainstream media in the United States had had processed and recognized this profound change in the patterns of Mexican migration to the United States. The whole thing of zero, when, when, we start, when we started talking about zero net migration in 2007, 2008, a lot of people would sort of look at us and say, what the hell are you talking about? By 2012, 2013, this had pretty well filtered down into how the media was covering the issue, conversations on Capitol Hill with members of Congress, and 2014, did a lot of damage in, in taking us back to this narrative of a border uh, under siege. Mm -hmm. And obviously the 2016 presidential election uh, was the cherry on the cake with uh, nativism and xenophobia and demagoguery as to what is and what isn't going on on the border. This has had a profound impact on setting us back in terms of how the general public, policymakers uh, in the U.S., and some of the media talk about and discuss this issue. Uh, let's pick up on that point because I, it's a good reminder and I, I hadn't actually been thinking about that until you mentioned it in the way you did, uh, uh, what the emergence of the Central American flow has actually represented in, in raising the, uh, the visibility again of uh, border enforcement along the southwest border. But, you know, it's a different flow. And it comes about for different reasons. Um, you know, you talked to Gil about the fact that by and large these are people that turn themselves in and want to be turned in because uh, they're making a, a claim for protection and that's a very important part of the border responsibility and it's an important part of the U.S. immigration system. But the Complexity and difficulty, of course, is that this is a mixed flow. Um, some people are eligible for protection, some people are not, and you have to make those distinctions, and that's a case-by-case -case undertaking. Um, let, let's talk about this from the standpoint first of, of, of resources. What's the resource answer? What's the enforcement strategy answer? Uh, uh, to this kind of a change in flows. And, um, and Arturo, I'd like you then to comment also on the Mexican piece of this in terms of Mexico as a country through which these people are coming. That's got a set of questions with it that um, um, uh, I'm going to 
dig through a little more, more fully. But Gil, you know, sure. we now have a flow. The, the, the predominant flow is the Central American flow. In 2014, for the first time, it outpaced the Mexican flow. That fell back in 2015 because of uh, enforcement jointly done by Mexico and the United States. But it's back now as the larger flow. And um, uh, so when one talks about resources and when one talks about enforcement strategies, how should we be reacting? So from a broad perspective, a 60,000 foot level, uh, the statements that have been made both in this administration and in the Obama administration about improving the quality of life, and probably not a great term, proving the safety, the security, and the economy of those three Central American countries would make an awful lot of sense. By the way, three Central American countries that uh, uh, together don't have the population of Mexico. Uh, so if Mexico, through the Merida Initiative, through their own hard work, through the leadership of, uh, of the Mexican government, could make the significant changes and improvements, uh, what can be done in those three Central American countries so people actually don't want to leave. Uh, I would sit down and, and have sat down on a number of occasions with, with families in, in uh, the detention facilities. And when they talk about the gang violence and the, and the fear and the concern, they talk about um, um, not being able to get a job or make sure that their kids have, a, a, have an opportunity for a good education. If those three countries are improved in those areas, you will see less people wanting to make that dangerous trek or to make that trek uh, to the United States. The second part of the resources, and, and I commend the administration on this and, and the Department of Justice, is to significantly move to increase the number of immigration judges. When you come across the border illegally, you are detained, uh, but you can only be detained for a certain period of time until your, your hearing. Uh, the hearings, as Doris mentioned earlier, are usually backed up and, uh, for a number of years. Uh, people think that, you know, if we've got gang violence and fear in a particular country that we're going to be admitted to the United States. Frankly, the bar is significantly higher than that. And many of the immigration judges' uh, uh, rulings, uh, uh, and including final uh, rulings on deportation, uh, sh show that people, even with some significant issues, uh, are not going to meet the threshold for safety. So one, if you're detained, and two, you get a timely hearing and that decision is made, uh, that can make a big difference in people. We saw the decreases when people were repatriated uh, or people, in a, and by the way, they almost universally pay a coyote to, to help get them across. It can be the, the, the amount has gone up, but it could be anywhere from $3,000 to $6,000. If you came across after paying $6,000, which would be pretty tough to come by in, in, in those countries, uh, and you were detained and then sent home back to, your, back to your village, it sends a pretty powerful message and, and frankly has a chilling effect on people that then say, okay, I'm going to come up with that amount of money uh, because I'm going to attempt to make that. So the Justice Department uh, increase in immigration judges is, I think, uh, something to be commended. Arturo, talk about Mexico with Central America because this is a real change for Mexico in, in Mexico's role. I mean, Mexico had traditionally, of course, been a, a sending country of migration to the United States, increasingly over time a, um, uh, a transit country, now much more a transit country and also a receiving country. Um, because people are being stopped in Mexico, and Mexico's southern border has become a real issue of activity for the Mexican government and also of criticism from the United States that the United States is outsourcing its responsibilities and coercing Mexico into getting involved in all of this. Um, to, to explain this to us and to talk about what it is that Mexico has done, um, how this debate, if it is taking place at all in Mexico, what is the debate? What does the Central American issue represent for Mexico? Yes, and I, I, I forgot to address the second part of your question. Uh, your 
first batch of questions, which was how U.S.-Mexico cooperation had, had advanced. So maybe let me start very quickly with that, and that, that will lead into this piece uh, uh, as to how current U.S.-Mexican cooperation on a number of issues uh, has or has not impacted what's going on on the southern border with, with, uh, between Mexico and Guatemala. What, one of the things that I think was profoundly transformed in the past 15 years was uh, the understanding that we had to develop a holistic vision for border management. And that means that, yes, while we deal with security issues, we also have to deal with um, trade facilitation and in enhanced connectivity and better uh, border infrastructure. Uh, why? Because um, if, if you've got a bilateral relationship where we trade $1.4 billion a day of goods a day, and we've got 1 million legal crossings in both directions every day, and we've got 75,000 trucks that reach our border in both directions every day, we'd better have a system that allows us to ensure that those flows go back and forth, but at the same time, that they're secure. In a post-9-11 world, um, the, the type of border that we had pre-9-11 uh, is untenable, given the type of relationship that we have today and the type of dynamics that we need to face together. So what Mexico and the United States started to understand was that the, there, there couldn't be a stovepipe vision of how we deal with the disparate issues that impinge upon the border in both directions. And what this developed was a greater understanding of how to build a holistic border management vision, risk-driven, where uh, sharing of intelligence and law enforcement cooperation was driving a lot of the uh, stuff that we were doing on the border, whether it was related to, to transnational organized crime or whether it was related to uh, targeted individuals that were on a terrorist uh, list, so uh, the border would not be used as a as a as a um, uh, jumping board for potential threats to U.S. national security, and and this this had a very profound impact on how U.S. and Mexican uh, government agencies started working with one another, and this is what's really uh, under threat and at stake today because the 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 use of Mexico as a political electoral piñata in the 2016 elections is threatening to undermine this holistic vision that we've built. It, in start, for starters, because um, it has forced the Mexican government to say, you, the U.S. administration, want to talk about NAFTA, a wall, and undocumented immigration. Well, for a country that isn't a political... Uh, geopolitical superpower, the only way that you level the playing field is by putting all your chips on the table. The Mexican government has decided now to link all the issues of the bilateral relationship in its negotiation with the United States, whether it's NAFTA related or whether it's linked to a wall. So the potential um, contamination of issues that have little bearing on how we've worked together on the border now today is real, and some of the stuff that we've done together in the past could start to unravel. So th this is something that I want to highlight. Th this, this brings me to your question of sort of w w what the debate in Mexico is today as to uh, what the current Mexican government has been doing on the southern border, border with Guatemala. Um, uh, we also have a border with Belize, but um, most of the issues here are uh, relevant to what's going on on the Guatemala-Mexico border. This has been a very heated debate, as you know well. For starters, because it has cost my compatriots um, and my former colleagues now in government some time to understand that if Mexico has been demanding a joint responsibility paradigm from the U.S. on, say, fighting drugs, that same paradigm of joint responsibility applies to other issues of the bilateral relationship. And that, yes, maybe most of the Central American migrants coming through Mexico want to get to the United States, but Mexico has some shape or form, if, if we are symmetrical in the joint responsibility paradigm, of how do we address transmigra transmigration flows through the Mexican territory. And I'll give you an example which given where the rhetoric and the debate over immigration is today, will show you how much we have to lose precisely because of this issue. As you remember, one of the issues that was included in one of the uh, executive, uh, one of the memoranda on immigration policy was the possibility of non-Mexican nationals being deported 
to Mexico uh, with this administration. Obviously, this has created a huge backlash and a huge outcry in Mexico. But I take you back to when we were uh, discussing uh, the uh, what what evolved from the Kennedy-McCain bill and then became the Senate bill of the Gang of Eight. Do you remember, Doris, particularly, that there was all this talk about a touchback clause? It, it was a euphemism as to how we could address the fact that there were 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States, that there was a substantial group of senators who did not want to be seen caving in on amnesty. And so the idea brewing those days on the Hill was, is there a way where we can send those 11 million undocumented immigrants out of the country, process them relatively quickly, and let them come back legally into the United States to, to defang the debate of, oh, you're providing amnesty to 11 million people. And the Mexican government, at the time, we were having discussions with members uh, uh, of the Senate as to how Mexico could, in a paradigm of joint responsibility, work with the U.S. to accept 11 million people, five of them, five million of them Mexican, but six million from other countries, into border cities, have them uh, processed by U.S. consulates along the Mexico-U.S. border, and return in 36, 48 hours back to the United States in a legal fashion. That conversation that was happening in 2010, 2011, 2012, today, W w is impossible because of how much poison and venom have been injected into the dis into the uh, discussion as to how these two countries need to work together. And this has also seeped into this whole debate as to what Mexico is doing or isn't doing on its southern border, in part because there are many sectors of Mexican public opinion that think that Mexico is doing the dirty work of the United States in terms of immigration policy and immigration control. Um, I am the son and grandson of refugees on both sides of my family, um, so I feel very strongly. I'm, I'm sort of caught, caught between a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, I think Mexico has a responsibility in working hand in hand with the United States to address transmigration and migration flows into the United States, um, but at the same time, uh, the Mexican government has been doing this uh, in gross violation of the right to refugee and asylum hearings of many potential claimants, uh, particularly from El Salvador and from Honduras, who could have legitimate claims uh, and which are not being provided that hearing and, and are being deported uh, straight back to either Honduras or El Salvador. Um, most of the discussion in Mexico is also uh, um, uh, pivoted around whether Mexico has gotten anything from the U.S. Uh, as a result of its willingness to cooperate on this front. And therefore, that's why this is one of the issues that has been thrown out there uh, as the uh, initial days of the Trump administration sort of ambushed uh, Mexican officials as one of the issues that Mexico could put on the table as a negotiating quid pro quo if the conversations over and after a wall immigration, etc., go south. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very touchy issue. Um, but I do think uh, the, you, you and I have discussed this for many years. Um, it is true the Mexican Constitution uh, provides for the free movement of Mexicans uh, 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 across Mexican territory. But um, immigration regulations do explicitly state that Mexicans need to cross into Mexico and leave Mexico through a designated port of entry. And so this has always generated a debate in Mexico as to, with, with, without obviously trampling constitutional rights, um, how does Mexico play a greater role in preventing undocumented crossings that don't occur through designated ports of entry? And so th this, this is part of the debate that is brewing as to what Mexico has been doing with the United States in response to the Obama administration's request for help um, in uh, uh, taking on this uh, very important uptick of Central American migration. And look, let's be clear, the Mexican government didn't do it either because they were dumb or because they were mother trees of Calcutta. They also understood, as the Obama administration understood, that if those patterns continued, they were going to bleed into the electoral politics 
of the United States, something that I think all of us would have wanted to prevent. Do you see Mexico making an effort to develop a... Uh, 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 to to put in place a, a, a political asylum system, a refugee uh, a determination system? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not there, and so uh, I'm not privy to day-to-day -day granular conversations. But, I, I, but in terms of the changing roles and the nature of the Central American flow I, I, and the geography? I think it, that, has, that, that has to be the logical step, Doris. Um, but I don't see it playing out, at least not now. And given that um, we're heading into loony season, uh, you've just come out of yours, uh, you're going to have another mini loony season next year too with your midterms, but we're heading into major loony season with our presidential election next year. And so a anything as significant as this, I think we'll have to wait at least until there's a new government uh, uh, as of December 2018. Let me comment on, on the yeah. border with Mexico uh, and, and Guatemala. Although I think... Loony season is uh, a technical term. But, <laughs> it's uh, in the dictionary. <laughs> okay, uh, but it was it, 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 it's been tremendously helpful to the United States uh, that uh, Mexico improved in so many ways and took on so many issues with, given given the border with uh, with Guatemala, and it has been helpful uh, and and it probably certainly plays a significant role in the in the reductions we're talking about. But there was also a benefit to to the country Mexican and, and, and Mexi not only not only the security issues, but as it became more and more difficult to to cross the border, as more resources from the United States were put uh, on the border for border security, it also meant that people that may, may be denied entry that may not be able to are now going to become part of the of the issue that uh, the government of Mexico will have to deal with, uh, and and we often saw that. So I, I think in, on the one hand it was uh, I mean the spirit of cooperation. Uh, uh, with uh, Mexican officials, um, not only PGR, but the federal police, uh, but also uh, the certainly significant with, uh, with immigration, uh, has been very helpful. And there's been a lot of lessons learned and, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, significant information, sharing of information that's been very helpful. And, and, and look, um, again, given the issue that I mentioned as to the interconnectedness of our agenda, um, in a, again, in a post-9-11 world, given the dynamics of, of how North America has morphed since then, if we're really serious about creating, creating common domain awareness for North America, uh, Mexico certainly needs to enhance its uh, operational control of, of its own border with, with, with Central America. Um, it, it, fits, it fits into this larger piece of how the three North American countries enhance our ability to, uh, to secure the North American uh, region. And so uh, even for purely national security reasons, it behooves Mexico certainly to upgrade uh, its ability to uh, uh, enhance its operation control of, of a border that until 10, 15 years ago was basically wide open. Right, right, exactly. This question of the future of Central America and Mexico being now the... Obviously, always has been geographically the next door neighbor, but it takes on an entirely different uh, uh, role and importance at this point. You know, Gil, you mentioned what, of course, is so true that ultimately conditions have to change in the countries themselves uh, in order to mitigate the drivers of the migration, both economic as well as the. Um, uh, uh, violence and, and, in some cases, uh, refugee-producing circumstances. But we knew that that, but that's a very long-term enterprise. Uh, that's, you know, a, a decades-long uh, enterprise. And it's interesting in the case of Mexico, you know, having been at it for as many years as we have been, all of us, <laughs> um, you know, Arturo, the, 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 picture with the U.S. and Mexico in the 1990s was a similar thing. Mexico needs to develop, conditions need to change in Mexico, and the amazing thing is that in fact they did. Um, and looking back, you know, 
10, 20 years in the scheme of things is a very long time when it's happening, but in retrospect, it isn't such a long time given the uh, nature of these challenges. But I think it's also fair to say that the Mexico is a much bigger country than the Central American countries. It has more to draw on, and it, ultimately there was NAFTA, which created a superstructure, a broad environment in which Mexico's economy could develop and did change. Take and, that uh, to Central America. And it, what's, an, what's and it, the, and it anchored the cooperation in ways that you, and you don't it also see created it. it also created a shared interest, exactly, and a stake, but in the macro issue, in the macro question of where the countries and where the region were going. How, can, how should one be thinking about translating that, if at all, to Central America? Is there an analogy, or are we really talking about a different dilemma? I, I, I've, I've always thought that um, in many ways uh, we both, the U.S. and Mexico, have a responsibility to try and pull Central America from its bootstraps. And that uh, in many ways there, there are two countries that I think could play a very important role. And we both have something in common, which is a paradigmatic shift in our own respective bilateral relationships with the United States. One of them is Colombia and the other one is Mexico. And if you quickly think of the map, um, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out why I'm saying Colombia and Mexico, because we both bookend Central America. And the role that these two countries could play in institutional strengthening, in greater sustained collaboration, uh, on a host of issues that we've been through, whether it was through Plan Colombia or the Media Initiative, in terms of uh, strengthening the judiciary and, and 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 institution building and watchdog capability creation in this in the in civil society, the, these are paradigms that could be replicated by Mexico and others uh, in the Central American region. I think the big challenge these days is appetite, bandwidth, and strategic vision, and I, I don't see that playing out at least at this stage. Uh, whether it's in Colombia, that is is for obvious reasons occupied and preoccupied with the final stages of the peace peace peace, peace, peace building uh, process with with FARC and eventually the ELN and Mexico that has obviously been uh, occupied and preoccupied by uh, its own uh, inability to take on uh, to significantly change the dynamics on the ground of public insecurity which are now ratcheting up again as, as we look at the numbers uh, to levels that we hadn't seen since 20, was probably the high point of violence in Mexico around 2010. Uh, the numbers have been increasing and that, I, th I think that is creating a, if you were to tell a Mexican policymaker, oh you've got to turn around look south and, and, and uh, help the Central American nations deal with their public security, insecurity, human security challenges, you're probably going to respond to, I've got to deal with my stuff here before I, I, mm -hmm. I commit any diplomatic uh, uh, or uh, 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 budgetary resources to doing something akin to what Mexico and the United States did together. But certainly that's the paradigm, Doris, and, and I, I see it as a uh, coalition of the willing of countries that can bring something to the table of countries that have a geo-strategic, geo-political stake in the region, and that's why I think of Colombia and Mexico, um, and and how we how we go about developing some of this. You want to add anything? To no, that? I think uh, no. My distinguished friend did an excellent job. So let's go back, Gil, to something um, uh, specifically relevant today with what it is that the expectations are about the southwest border and that is this no this concept of operational control um, and the way in which it is defined it's been defined a variety of different ways i think it was first defined legislatively in the secure fence act in 2006 um, uh, the border patrol has grappled with how to define it um, and we now have in the executive order on the border, uh, I think, a new definition uh, and a very bottom line definition, which is that operational control means and is expected to mean no 
unlawful entries of any kind, to which I think one must read as, although it doesn't say this, people, goods, drugs, whatever, um, uh, in terms of the border itself and what happens at the border. I mean, I'm not going to ask you if that's realistic. That's unrealistic. Um, but could you comment on what would be realistic? Um, what should we be expecting from border enforcement? And, um, uh, and, and, and what do you think represents the best thinking of law enforcement professionals uh, on what, in fact, is operational control? What is a sufficiently safe, not even sufficiently safe, a, a safe border from the standpoint of the various uh, legitimate concerns that we have as a country, a sovereign nation, uh, about security of our borders. Well, when I was a police chief, I'd often get asked, is Seattle a safe city? And I'd say, well, how, how do you want to define that? How should, is that because it has a low crime rate? Or is it because it has a high number of police officers? Is it because they respond to an emergency call in three minutes or less? Is it because of citizen surveys or surveys of the business on, on how people feel safety and security? So it was just this, this wide open kind of, of, of discussion. Operational control and border security, the two terms most frequently used, are, are essentially meaningless terms, although they're not meaningless uh, for, for one reason. They are used predominantly for political posturing. Uh, uh, the, the issue of border security, and, and we, we can't do anything on immigration until the border is secure, but no one could really define it, and no one could uh, no one could quite understand that. So I, I think that when we we talk about this, uh, about what can be done and what is realistic, is that you know we have a, a significantly large border with Canada, but, you know much longer. We have two uh, gigantic sea coasts. It certainly isn't. Uh, it certainly is a fact that we've apprehended people coming in and in, in a variety of other locations, not to the extent uh, of. The, of the southwest border, but recognizing that uh, 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 the same way that uh, that a government uh, uh, and, uh, and and a police chief should be honest and transparent with the community, we, we do have crime, and we all have a stake in in trying to make it and uh, uh, trying to make our city more safe. And we need uh, and expect and want the trust and cooperation of the people within that community to report crime. Uh, we have more resources, more funds. Uh, on, on the border. Uh, Tony Payan's book came out in 2006 on three border wars. And in it, he mentions um, a member of Congress, a, a congresswoman from uh, North Carolina. And she talked about the, the continue the fear that al-Qaeda would be sending terrorists across the border. So she made those comments in 2005. Well, here we are in 2017. Uh, the only change in the rhetoric about terrorists uh, perhaps coming across the border has been that they would be uh, terrorists from ISIS or, or Daesh versus uh, from, uh, uh, from al-Qaeda. Uh, you know, you can only keep people's fear alive so long before they sit back and say, you know, what, what are you actually telling me? And I think what we want to do to in, improve and gain trust of, of people and also to let them know that, you know, more work, more resources are, are being put into this. Will bad things happen in a country the size of the United States? You know, they certainly will. Uh, but there's never a more dedicated group than, uh, uh, than the people that took an oath of office, these law enforcement professionals, to actually uh, uh, protect the communities, to protect the border. And I think they're, they're doing an incredible job, and that's evidence not just by the numbers, uh, but it's, you know, we also have to recognize that, that too much of the fear rhetoric uh, 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 is not helpful to one people that live here, but it certainly isn't helpful to our economy. As we tell people, uh, you, you're going to be, uh, uh, you're going to go through extreme vetting, whatever that means when you come into the United States. Think about uh, the university that I just left at Harvard, uh, with the number of people that were very concerned about students that uh, were applying and were very interested in going not just to Harvard, but to all of these very expensive colleges. Those foreign students pay full freight. 
And that means when they pay full freight that there's a lot of other people that are going to get the benefit of that uh, economy. Think of tourism. Think of uh, the number of people that want to come here and do business uh, in this country. If it is going to be extremely difficult uh, for them to do that, or and I saw where New Zealand, Australia, and Canada have all upped their uh, uh, advertisements for foreign students. Uh, as, a, as a result of this. So, you know, we should, we should think about, one, the law of unintended consequences on, on how much we continue to, to hype this, and then we only need to go down to the border uh, uh, in, in, from small towns to San Diego and recognize that, one, most of these are incredibly safe communities, regardless of the size, and that the, the ability for people to work together, cooperate, uh, uh, back and forth across the border uh, is, is one that's very important to our economy. Okay, we're going to open to questions. Um, we'll bring around a microphone if you raise your hands and we ask that you tell us who you are. In addition, um, I'll be watching the <coughs> Twitter questions and try to take some uh, uh, from the live stream as well. I see a hand in the back. <coughs> Good morning. Thank you uh, for the panel. Um, Ron Nixon from the New York Times. I want to follow on your question that you had about um, operational control of the border to expand that a little bit, which is what actually is the, the goal um, <clears throat> when you have the, the, the boots on the ground, you've got towers, drones, sensors, all of those, those different things. What should be the metrics for measuring how safe the border is or isn't, uh, and what are the metrics that, that are used? And I know, Gil, you were commissioner, so if you could talk a little bit about that, and Doris, I mean, you were part of the administration uh, as well. So if, if the two of you could sort of address that, what, what exactly are we talking about, more to your point about border security? What does that, that mean? And how do you actually achieve it, and what are you measuring uh, when you say that you have border security? Thank you. Yeah, Secretary Johnson, uh, uh, as, as many of you know, brought in a, a, a large number of economists uh, from the, the Pentagon to begin to work on the uh, uh, on the definitions and the and the metrics and. Uh, the end result reminded me of, of what President Truman said, you know, if you could lay out all the economists end to end, wouldn't that be a beautiful sight? <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, I think that there's both a metric as far as numbers. You know, does the Border Patrol have sufficient people? Are the areas of land sufficiently covered, whether it's electronically or whether uh, with, with predators or, uh, or others? So you can look at that, miles of fencing and, and, uh, and, and increases in that, and then whether or not. But I always get a little concerned about the numbers because, as we know from the unaccompanied children, you know, it really wasn't a, a question of them trying to come into the country, uh, especially the children, for, for jobs, but to be reunited. So even, even though the border was more secure, you know, they were still coming in, still making that claim. Uh, but if, um, uh, so I, I, I think the metric issue can be a little concerning. I think Doris brought up and, and uh, 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 crime rates in those cities along the border. There are I mean, there are many cities within the United States, in the Midwest and others, that would uh, would be very pleased to have crime rates as low as San Diego, Tucson, El Paso, uh, in, incredibly low crime rates. Um, um, so uh, I, I think trying to, to get your head and arms around the metrics uh, of, of, of what is a secure border. You know, I always remember uh, then Governor Brewer being uh, testifying and saying, you know, I, the border needs to be secure. And I, I think it was then Senator Lieberman that kind of leaned over the podium and said, could you define the secure border for me? And I think Governor Brewer was not able to, to define what is a secure border. But you know, people, I mean, you know, as a police chief, people recognize that there's going to be crime. They need to be vigilant. They need to do their part. Um, 
but we're not we're not helping the situation when we stand on the border and point across and and tell people to be very afraid and we're not helping ourselves if we uh, as a government are not very transparent to the people who pay the taxes and if we're not very transparent to the uh, uh, to the elected officials, I, th I think that's a, 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 a significant error, and I think it erodes faith and trust and confidence. Uh, let me just add one point to that, and that is that <clears throat> there is a holy grail, what I think of as a holy grail number, that nobody has been able to nail, and that is the flow. Um, we know how many we apprehend. There's always the debate between apprehensions as an activity, it's not a person, but it's generally accepted that it is a valid proxy for uh, the, the, you know, numbers of, of, of individuals. But what we can't, what we have, we collectively, the research community, the government agencies, uh, economists, who probably get as, about, as good a rap as lawyers, it's probably lawyers and economists, uh, anyway, is the what is the flow? It's because until, in a purest sense, you know what the rate of movement uh, of people is across the border, you can't really debate an effectiveness number um, in the Secure Fence Act debate, the post uh, period to that, it kept being 80% somewhere, you know, when are we going to be 80% effective, 80, 85% effective. You can only know 80, 85%, 90, 70, 60, whatever, if you know the denominator. And that's the flow. Now, there's been an ongoing debate that, and the Border Patrol has tried to map the flow. Because after all, the border is virtually seeable um, through the combination of sensors, the uh, uh, visual technology, the pings, the, you know, their whole set of things. And they have actually come a far way in being able to map what the movement is. But there still are some technical difficulties in knowing what's a double counting because somebody can ping here and then go that way and ping there and you can't always tell who, who it is, et cetera, et cetera. But that, the time will come and I think possibly sooner than later uh, given how much the flow is down and how much of the flow actually people start to turn themselves in, et cetera, et cetera, then you really would, with numbers, pretty much be able to solve this. But until that time comes, there is room for the kind of um, seeing it as one wants to see it that, that, that Gil has been describing. In the back. Thank you. Uh, Daniela Berkey-Palmino from the Latin America Working Group. I just had two questions. Um, in your, in, in, as we analyze sort of changing trends along the U.S.-Mexico border and looking at apprehension numbers uh, being down in the last uh, first months of this year, including from Central American families and unaccompanied uh, minors, I'm wondering um, if you have thoughts on what potentially could be missing from that assessment beyond simply looking um, and saying that the policies of fear have had an impact in deterring people from coming here. Um, and I say this because we've certainly seen testimonies of um, families uh, from the region saying that the policies have not had um, an impact in their decision making and also that we know that you know talking about conditions in Central America have not drastically changed it's a long-term effort as we've already mentioned um, and also that there could be other practices along the border and in fact there are that our partners have documented of CBP um, agents telling people uh, not to enter um, ports of entry not to enter the US um, even when they've claimed fear um, at ports of entry, turning them back, um, leaving them in a situation of vulnerability and danger along uh, Mexico's northern border. And that could also be playing a role. So I'm wondering what, what, what you think is missing in that assessment, and given your experience, how long you think those trends might last? Um, because certainly um, we might say that it's too early to tell. Um, and my second question is looking at addressing root causes in Central America. 
We've already talked about how it's a long-term effort, but how do we make sure that that is a discussion uh, that doesn't leave out uh, human rights and that doesn't leave out civil society? Um, and I say this also because there is an upcoming dialogue uh, that the US and Mexico are co-hosting to look at Central America um, in June, and that seems to be driven from a security and sort of economic or private sector uh, perspective. Um, and so, you know, we we have a fear that only looking at it from that perspective and cutting back on development assistance to the region and the assistance that we would like to see at civil society would like to see will only have a detrimental effect actually in pushing people, continuing to push people out. So, how do we make sure that is not lost from discussion? of addressing root causes in Central America. Thank you. Well, you certainly, uh, uh, I mean, I think the questions are very appropriate. There's no, no doubt that there has been a Trump effect on these reductions. But January through March, I think I looked at the numbers, about 83,000 people came through in the, in the three months, uh, et cetera. That's about the size of Iowa City or, or, or Bryan, Texas. Uh, so I don't think when it comes to, to trying to define, well, now the border is secure. Well, if the border was not secure when 60,000 people were coming across or 40,000 on, on a monthly basis, here in three months, 83,000 people, it's a pretty significant number of, of, of folks uh, coming through. So I, I think that uh, uh, the effect of, one, you're going to be detained, uh, you're not going to, uh, uh, and you're probably Probably more than likely, this is you know what is often talked about. You're more than likely going to uh, uh, be returned back to your country. Uh, it, it has had has had some impact. Uh, the expansion of detention uh, beds, the expansion of immigration judges, uh, and the discussion around that is also uh, is also true. Uh, I think that there's a lot of concern that uh, uh, the talk about. Uh, uh, Reducing funding in the State Department is is not particularly helpful. Reducing funding for USAID and others. I mean, Merida, and well, as we all know, foreign aid is is like less of, significantly less than one percent of the federal federal budget. Merida had had a tremendous impact, I, I think, on on Mexico. Plan Colombia had a tremendous impact on that country, um, and I think for not. A, a huge investment, and, and I'm not sure I'd agree with Doris that it would take decades. I think that we already have some pretty good templates in Mexico and in uh, in Colombia where we could be more helpful and make greater progress uh, uh, faster uh, in those three Central American countries. Uh, do you want to add something? Just, just sort of on the Mexico-U.S. Central America um, meeting that's that's coming um, if I was in the Mexican government which I'm not uh, one of the beauties of being a recovering diplomat is that you can uh, say stuff uh, in ways that it, you couldn't in the past um, I, I would certainly try and make sure that this is a comprehensive agenda um, because you don't want to replicate paradigms uh, of the US Mexican bilateral dialogue on um, uh, social resilience on human security that don't factor in the role of civil society, the role of, of sustainable uh, economic development, uh, social inclusion. So if, if I'm not privy to what the agenda for that June meeting uh, looks like, but um, if the only thing that is put on the table in that dialogue is the hard stuff, the security piece, then I think both Mexico, the U.S., and the Central American countries that are coming to that dialogue would be making a huge mistake. It has to be a holistic dialogue, and the more you include the private sector and civil society and the formal NGO world that is working on a number of issues, and particularly in what the in um, in El Salvador and Honduras, because that, that's where you have this very poisonous mix of um, insecurity and lack of economic opportunity because mo mo most of the Guatemalan migration to the United States is rural and economic, whereas what you're seeing from what uh, from El Salvador and Honduras are basically uh, urban and driven by the the Mara and the gang violence um, and the recruiting practices of the of the of the gangs in in those two countries. So 
it it should it should be a holistic agenda but i i have no elements to tell you oh yes it's going in that direction or or we we should hit the panic button and start uh creating some noise because it's not going to be a holistic agenda i don't know but that that's what it should look like question up here Hi, my name is Mariana. I'm from the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. My question is for you. Um, you mentioned the narrative going on in the media here um, in the United States pertaining to migration. So I wanted to get your perspective on how this perception regarding um, migration can be reversed um, based on these new findings um, that have been published today. Thank you. Whew. Um. If I had an answer to that, I, 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 I don't know. Um, it's going to be very hard. Um, dis despite the demagoguery of these past months, and despite the real impact that it has had on the day-to-day -day workings of the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship, um, it takes more than Trump to derail 20 years of a dramatic shift in the way that government agencies have been working day to day. Um, but where I think there's some serious damage done is in perceptions. Perceptions on both sides of the border as to why these two countries need to be co-state holders to each other's success. Um, I, I spent the whole campaign banging my Twitter account with hard data and facts and to no avail because as you all saw alternative facts seem to rule the day um so the question is to how do we use the data that we all have that we all see that we all know to sort of impact the conversation once again it, i think is going to be a very tough dynamic i i think we have to find um I think that we will need to distend the uh, political environment and landscape of the conversation. I think the I think Congress and in particular the Senate plays a very important role, despite um, my uh, concern and anger as to uh, how the U.S. Mexico relationship is being ambushed by the my way or the highway approach to policy. I'm very encouraged by what I saw on two very separate issues in the past couple of weeks. Uh, a majority of Dems, it, there were also Republicans, but a majority of Dems pushing back against the issue of the wall as part of the uh, deal for the uh, funding of government, um, I think was a very important piece. And then 40 hours later, uh, a very important group of GOP senators pushing back against the idea of an executive order uh, being uh, put out there to uh, uh, have the U.S. pull out of NAFTA. And so I, I, th I, th I think that Capitol Hill, but in particular the Senate, can, can play a role in sort of trying to redirect the conversation. Um, obviously, if we can inject uh, the more data uh, and the more hard facts into that conversation as possible, that helps. But given that we truly have seen that we live in a post-truth world here and in, and, in, and in Europe, and increasingly, in, in, uh, and I think... Um, I hope I'm wrong, but I think we're going to see a lot of this play out in the Mexican presidential cam campaign uh, next year. Uh, how you articulate and how you create um, uh, a, a different benchmark based on hard data is, is one of the most vexing challenges of any public policy uh, discussion or public uh, policy officials. Um, I think storytelling will have to play a very important role in how you put this data out there. Um, but it's going to be a challenge. Let me just make yeah. one more quick comment, uh, uh, going back to the question uh, uh, from the back also. Just uh, CBP has 60,000 employees. When I went down that first week in, uh, in the summer of 14, there was no help or assistance from any other part of the federal government. There were some NGOs and others. But, you know, no one else was there, and the people dealing with this with this massive number of, of kids, mostly kids coming through, were all Border Patrol agents. And I saw them microwaving burritos. I saw them handing out space blankets, a room this size. Every, every square foot was, was filled with some, with some child sleeping. They were uh, uh, bringing clothes in from their own kids. Uh, there, so this kind of, 
issue now that, well, now they've been unleashed or now they can go about doing the job, they're going to stay within the parameters and the guidelines of the law and the policy uh, and the training. And there have always been complaints uh, about uh, everything from rudeness and discourtesy uh, to asking people about their religious beliefs. Uh, but when you think about well over a million people coming into the United States every day, I mean, the, the, I never saw more professionalism, more people that were willing to uh, to do the important job of protecting the uh, protecting the country, but doing it in a way uh, uh, within the constitutional framework. And uh, so, you, you know, I wouldn't be overly concerned that because of w whatever rhetoric comes out from from somebody right now, uh, that they're gonna, now they're they're being unleashed to be able to do their job. They're going to do their job within the uh, within the confines of the the rules and regulations. And frankly, they're are going to treat people as as uh, as humanely and courtesy, courteously today as I saw them do with those kids. Okay, we're going to need to leave that be the last word. Uh, there, uh, you know, the overall question here of the disconnect between what we know and what the discourse is is what it is that we try to contribute to <laughs> narrowing. And so I hope that this has been useful in putting some more information on the table uh, that is important. Uh, we had a couple of Twitter questions that I didn't get to because they were on points that were already being addressed by the answers and the um, discussion that we had. So I do want to be sure that our live stream audience knows that we have been paying attention and uh, 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 and have been incorporating. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Arturo, Gil. Uh, very, very important discussion, and thank you for being with us.